Hey everyone, we are getting ready to start our weekly class on YouTube Live, and thanks for joining us, thanks for watching this. While we're all stuck at home, not able to go out and get together, want to make sure that we have the opportunity to continue our training. So today what I want to do is we're going to look at the guards with the long sword, and we're going to be focusing on the specific positions and angles with those guards to make sure that we're hitting the correct position. These are not the exact guards that we see in Fiore's manuscript, Fiore de Vitaglia. <clears throat> These are the guards, the way I teach them at the school. They're close, but they're not exactly the same. And so we're going to focus on the guards and then making sure we hit all the correct positions with those. Then we're going to go into the unarmed guards, which is fairly simple. But then we're going to take those and we're going to look at a couple of actions that I teach in the Be Safe class, my women's self-defense escape and evade class. So we're going to move from longsword to unarmed to use of the unarmed action. It's going to be a good time. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad you're here. When you come in, please say hello. Uh, and Ezekiel, hello. Good to see you. Uh, would a, Ezekiel wants to know if a Lutel arming sword would work for the side sword class. Sure, that'd be fine. Understand, though, that there's going to be some slight differences because with a side sword, you generally have some kind of cage or knuckle bow to put over your fingers. With the arming sword, you don't. So there's going to be a small change in the way you move it so you are protecting your hand as you swing. Uh, after this class for the our Patreon page, we're doing a rapier and dagger class. So that one will be posted up on our Patreon page, sword fighting for. Let's go ahead and get started with the guards. Remember, the basics are like the scales in music. Warm up with the basics, then move into your other actions. In Fiori's manuscript, there are 12 guards. At our school, we teach 13. I took one from Filippo Body and have incorporated that one into what we teach. So with our 13 guards, the way it's broken up is we have five low, four middle, three high, and then one outside. Fiori has the five low, four middle, three high, and then I added the outside one. Because of the way that we generally tend to learn, it's easier to start and learn them in an order, and then you can see how they move around yourself. I prefer to always start at our feet because everything starts at your feet and then moves up. If I start up high, what happens, and we see this happen a lot in lots of different martial arts, we get so focused on what we're doing with our hands that our feet never move. And while it can be done, it is unsafe for you because you're not getting out of the way of incoming attack. And if you're using this to put on some kind of show, it doesn't look right because there's no foot movement. And that's not how people fight when they engage. So when we start low, I'm going to start facing the camera, and John is going to be just behind me and facing sideways to the camera. Our first guard that we're going to start with is Middle Iron Door, Meza, Porta de Ferro. Middle Iron Door, Meza, Porta de Ferro. I'm going to start with my left foot forward. My sword is in line with my navel, point at the ground, shoulders down, and my back hand is relaxed. I'm not gripping it because if I do, I can't get it down without lifting my shoulders, so I relax my grip. I don't need to hold it if I'm not using it. I, I don't need to hold it tight if I'm not using it. 
Middle Iron Door, Meza Porta de Ferro. From Meza Porta de Ferro, I'm going to leave my pommel where it is in front of my navel. And I'm just going to pull my right elbow back and open my hand so that my thumb is not gripping the sword. Just pulling it back like this means that I am leading with my true edge. I've retracted my lead arm. It's no longer a uh, target, and my sword is to the side. This is called Tuta Porta de Ferro, open iron door. Tuta Porta de Ferro, open iron door. From Tuta Porta de Ferro, you're going to leave your hands as they are in this position, but you're going to push your pommel to the front of your hip socket. So your arms are just moving around your body, and the pommel is sitting right in front of the hip socket. Still leading with your true edge, but your blade is at about 45 degrees behind you. This is called Kodalanga, or tail guard, or Choda Longa in the Getty Manual. So tail guard, Kota Longa. Back to Tuta Porta de Ferro, open iron door. And then I'm going to go back to Kota Longa, tail guard. I'm going to just push or rotate my hands around my body. Now, as I'm standing here, you can see how that really twists my shoulder out of place, and I've twisted my body to break my own structure. From that, what I want to do to protect against that twisting in Tooth of Port Pharaoh, I'm square, but as soon as I go to Kodalanga, tail guard, I twist. So I counter that by moving my lead foot over and back. So if I'm in Meza Porta de Ferro, middle iron door, and I just pull my elbow back, I naturally hit Tuta Porta de Ferro and widen out, so I go into Cota Longa. I have two ways I can get to Cota Longa. If I go back to open iron door, I can widen out my stance to go to Cota Longa, or what we see in Pure's manuscript, is as I go to Kodalunga, I do a tuta volta with my back foot. And I'm just up on my on my toe. That puts my blade at straight behind me. And you'll notice it also squares up my shoulders more. Whereas if I'm here, I'm, my shoulder is much more extended. But if I'm standing in front of my partner, so if you just put your sword on my shoulder, so, here's where he's touching it. But when I go to Kota Longa, look how much space I move between his point and my body. So I can either do a tuta volta to open up space, or I can wind down my lead foot to open up space. Either one of those work, and they square up your shoulders, meaning that your next action is going to be easier because you have more possibilities available to you. Uh, oh, Steve. Good to see you. Glad to have you here. And Sky, glad to have you here as well. The reason we want to square up our shoulders from in Kodalanga is if I do if I'm here and go to another one, now I want you to move that to that. Okay. So when he moves to his right, my left, everything, I need to twist my body before I can even get my sword into place. If I do this, I still left the target in place. Go ahead. Seven. And the action of moving my hand up, let's do it again. I actually just moved the place. Bringing my sword around naturally squares up my body. So if I start with my body already squared, I cut out a bit of time, a beat of time that's not needed by squaring up my body. And again, I can do that by either moving my lead foot or my back foot. 
to go back in the fortune. And I'm in no one like this. Go ahead and set this item study. I get that. But if I wipe out my skin, do that again. My body doesn't need to move. Or if I'm in tell mode and I do this, but I do it again, my body doesn't need to move. But if I twist it, my body moves and that makes me later. Can you feel it? So I need to square up my body to cut a bead of time out. And I can do it either way. There are, again, five guards on the low line. Man the port of the pharaoh. Two the port of the pharaoh. For the longer. And I can widen out my stance. No choice. Let's go back to middle line door. Man the port of the pharaoh. I'm now going to step forward. Now my right foot is forward because I'm right-handed, and I'm going to pull my pommel to my left hip. Dente di chingale. Again, dente di chingale, or boar's tooth. Now with boar's tooth, you'll see that my shoulder's twisted forward again. Anytime my lead arm has to cross my body, it twists my body. So my lead arm does not matter if it's right or left. If it's going across my body, I need to widen out my stance. So because I'm in boar's tooth, dente di chingale, I can pull my lead foot over and back, and that squares me up. Or I can uh, move my back foot forward. We generally tend to, when we have to widen out our stance, I want you to widen it out by moving your lead foot, not your back foot. And here's why. If John sticks his horse straight out, and he's not quite touching me, but I adjust my foot, so you can see he's not touching me there. If I widen out my stance with my back foot, that puts him in contact with me. If I start in contact and I widen out my stance with my knee foot, that pulls me away. Overall distance is measured from your back foot. So if you adjust your stance with your back foot, you are messing with the distance between you and your opponent. If you use your lead foot, you are adjusting the measure to your uh, for your opponent's closest target so if i'm in uh let's go into men's to the crowd put the sword on my feet on so you can see the cross that he's got there if i move my oh, and i can still hit him on the arm here but if i move my lead foot He's now missing me, but I'm still in the same measure to get him with my glove. So put it back on my arm. If, however, I move my back foot, he missed me, but so did I. I can touch him on that wrist, but I'm no longer as deep as I was. So back foot controls overall distance. Lead foot controls target distance. Be careful which foot you move so that you know how it is going to affect the measure between you and your opponent. And that would be in Dente di Chingale. If I'm in, no, sorry, go to Longa. Tell guard. If I'm in tell guard and I widen out my stance with my lead foot. I didn't change distance, so let me put this on you. So I've got distance. Let me put on I've got distance where I can touch him on the shoulder. If I move my lead foot over and back, I can still touch him on the shoulder. However, if I move my back foot in, and I don't lose my balance, I'm actually deeper on him. So from here. 
my shoulders are squared up, but I'm deeper on him than if I was wiped out my stance with my lead foot. Now I'm not as deep. So your back foot changes overall distance between you and your opponent, and your lead foot changes target distance between you and your opponent. You want to be careful about which foot you move because of those effects. Now we've done tail guard, open iron door, middle iron door, boar's tooth. For the longa, tooth the port to the pharaoh, meza port to the pharaoh, then te di chingale. Now, there are five on the low line. In Pure, he has us in boar's tooth. Oh, one thing I want to add about guard. As a general rule, for us, not in pure, for us, as a general rule, whichever side your sword is on, that foot is back. So if I'm on an open iron door, because my sword's on my right side, I want my right foot back. That keeps my body a little more square. If I had my right foot forward, my knee is now in front of my sword. And I can choose that, but that's a tactical decision from later. So whichever side your sword is on, that foot is back. Let's go back to Dente di Chingale. Uh, I'm here. I'm in Dente di Chingale. In our next guard, we call it uh, open boar suit. This is not the guard in Fiore. In Fiore, he uses uh, middle boar suit. And he does it this way. He leaves his sword where it is. And does a bolt to stop that. But as you do it, your sword doesn't move. Your elbow comes up and you pull it in tight. There is a middle board to in Fiore. At the school, we use what we call open boards to. And in open boards to, I do a bolt to stop leg, but I take my sword with me. And I keep it tied on my hip, and I just turn my foot out, put my weight onto my left foot. We call this open board two, or uh, that'd be tuta dente de chingale, versus meza, or dente de chingale mezana. That's what this one is. Mezana, tuta. And here's why we do it this way. So you can see his position. He's going to lay it nicely on my head. See but when I go to open board two, I remove the target and my body taking it out of the way. I do a void of the target. There. That takes out. He skipped off my shoulder. You see how far out he is. He's just scraping my shoulder. Which means any movement I do to him is going to make him miss me. I'm not moving my body much. Instead, I am moving my body enough. And there's a big difference between those two. My five low guards. Tail guard. So, for the tail guard. Open iron door. Middle iron door. Boar's tooth. Open boar's tooth. There's our five low guard. That takes us up. Let's see if there's any. Okay, so that takes us up to our middle guards. Our middle guards are four. We have four guards. Again, as a general rule, for us, whichever side your foot is on, or whichever side your sword is on, that foot is backward, that in the back. If the sword is in the middle of your body, nose to navel, on that line, 
like middle iron door, you can have either foot forward because it doesn't adjust your shoulder orientation to your opponent. So that is a good rule to remember. If you're in the middle of your body, you can have either foot forward. We now have four guards in the middle line. We'll start in middle iron door. Meza Forte de Ferro. From this guard, push your pommel down and hold it out. Now, right now, you'll see that your sword is right in the middle of your body. You do not want this guard in the middle of your body because it does you no good. This guard is either going to be to one side or the other. And as I'm doing it, I'm moving my, my uh, shoulders, but my wrist is not moving. It's just a rotation to hide behind it. And I can do it with my true edge or my false edge, depending on what they're doing. So post to breve is not in the middle. It's to one side or the other. And it's not in tight on you. It's extended out and down. Post to breve, short guard. From short guard, we're going to start with our uh, right foot forward. Extend out and let your pommel hand rotate around your pommel so that your middle finger knuckles are resting on the inside of your arm. I'm sorry, not your middle finger, the fingertips, your fingernails are resting on the inside of your forearm. So you complete that circuit. You created a triangle between your arms. This is posta lunga or long guard. Posta lunga, long guard. Posta breve, posta lunga. Go back to posta breve. From posta breve, short guard, you're going to push up. Let your hands rotate, uh, your pommel hand, rotate around your pommel so the middle knuckles are now touching your forearm. And you're looking over the true edge quillen at your opponent's face. This is posta frontale o corona, or frontal guard of the crown. Fiori says many masters call this uh, corona, crown guard. He calls it frontale, frontal guard. So, posta frontale o corona, or frontale, or in English, crown guard. Short guard, crown guard. And as I do that, if you watch the hands, short guard, you see how the pommel hand rotates and it brings my quillen around so my true edge quillen is protecting my left arm. My false edge quillen is protecting my right arm, and I'm looking directly over my true edge quillen at my opponent's face. That's how I know I've hit this position correctly. There are our three middle guards. We have one more to do. Short guard. It's gonna to be to one side or the other. Uh, long, long guard, post longa. And post frontale. Our last guard, we're going to end post frontale. Frontal guard or crown guard. I've got my middle knuckles resting on the, my forearm of my right hand or my right arm. I'm looking over my quillens at my opponent's face and I just extend my sword down. So now my point and my pommel are parallel. My pommel is in front of my right shoulder, and this is uh, posta bicornio, or guard of the two horns, posta bicornio. It's called bicornio because it's named after a rhinoceros. There's the front horn of the rhinoceros, there's the back horn of the rhinoceros. One of the ways I like to think of the bicornio guard is that it's a really good guard to use against somebody whose spirit animal is rhinoceros. If I have somebody who's just charging in, and I'm in boar's tooth, I can stab him in long guard, but I'm still going to get hit. Uh, Machelino in the 1530s 
then if you have a double hit, you are the victor and the vanquished at the same time. So the goal is not just to hit him, but to make sure you don't get killed as well. If, however, I go to by Cornio, I start in four to mid iron door, short card, by Cornio, I'm going to put it over his shoulder. I put it through his face, and Mike Quillins stopped his sword. Whereas, if I go to long guard, I put it through his body, but I still get hit. So we use by Cornio when we are under our opponent's sword. And we use long guard when we're on top of our opponent's sword. Let's do that again. He comes in at me. This time, I start in cell guard. So I'm going to start here. He goes ahead and does that. And I go over his sword. I'm safe. And he's not. If I come under his sword, neither one of us are safe. But if I do by cornio, I'm safe, he's not. Now in this by cornio, I put it in front of my left shoulder, not my right shoulder. And the difference between the two is a rotation of the lead hand. So if I'm in by cornio on my right side, my palm is in front of my right shoulder. If I go to by cornio on my left side, I turn my lead hand so that my fingertips are up, my two edge quillin is up, and my palm moves in front of my left shoulder. What we've done with this rotation, go ahead and that for a second is created another triangle. Outside of the circle or the arch, the triangle is the strongest shape we know of at this point in time. So we're going to utilize those in our guard. If I go to my corneo and I assume that I'm attacking the middle of my opponent's body, if, I, if I'm in front of my right shoulder, I have my sword on the right side of the triangle. I am the base of the triangle. And as soon as I rotate, there's the left side of the triangle. Can you go to break that way? So, my corner on the right, my corner on the left. And it's important to understand them both because. The side I use is going to be dependent upon what kind of attack is coming at me. So if I go to by corneo on the right, and he's given me a tendente, I stuck it to his chest. But you can see the problem with this. However, if I go to by corneo on the left, I'm now safe. And it's above my head. And he cannot push through it. An interesting thing about Bicornio, as we've talked about in other videos, there are four known manuscripts from Fiori at this point. In those four manuscripts, there are three variations on Bicornio. I can do it here, I can do it here, or I can do it here. All of those are correct. The difference between crown guard and by corneo is the height of my point. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, how is um, by corneo on the right any different than long guard is a question that we just have. Mm, good, good question. In long guard, because my fingernails are touching my forearm, my point is higher than my pommel. But in by corneo, my pointed pommel are parallel. That's the difference between bicornio and long guard. The other difference, let me take off my gloves so you can get a better picture of this, is that in bicornio or long guard, 
You see where my thumb is? I'm going to keep my thumb out. We don't do this, but I'm going to keep my thumb out. See the difference of it, of the position of my fingers in relation to my lead arm. That's the difference. Now, uh, let me go back just a little bit to a low guard. And that is to uh, Tuta Porta de Ferro. And Tuta Porta de Ferro, it's to the side. When we take this right now, you can see that there's space between my two hands. In Fjord, the hands are together. And then I'm hiding the pommel behind my wrist. And this is because I'm gonna use my wrist to help move my point faster. If my hands are separated, I need to, uh, can you step on your foot? Yes, sir. So if I'm using my sword as a measurement guide, if I start in two to port de ferro with my hands separated and I bring my point around so it goes completely across my body, you can see how far off the center line I had to move. If I bring my hands together and I do the same thing, I did not need to move my hands as far and I can use my pommel and under, under my wrist to help facilitate the movement of my point. So. If I'm just relaxing, I'll keep my hands separate. But when I'm about to use it, I might bring my hands together so I can use more force on my pommel to move my lead hand with less required movement of my mass. So I wanted to point that difference out between uh, open iron door due to Porta de Ferro, the way that it's been shown and the way I teach it, to be honest, I teach it with our hands separate until they get a little bit higher, then in levels. Then I bring their hands together because now we have tactical choices that we can make. And I don't want them to confuse themselves beforehand. So we have five low guards starting at tail guard, Totalonga. Two to port to the ferro, open iron door, mezzo port to the ferro, middle iron door, dente di chingale, forest tooth, and dente di chingale dusta, open iron, open port. Or, if I leave my sword in place, middle board. Middle guard are post breve, short guard, post longa. Long guard, bicornia, uh, two horn, and crown guard. Crown guard is a middle guard, not a high guard. And it's quite often assumed to be a high guard because the point's so high. But the way I like to think of it is it's a middle guard because the pommel is below my shoulder. If the pommel is above my shoulder, it's a high guard. And we're going to go into our high guards next. There are five low, four middle, three high. Our first guard, high line, is woman's guard. There's a lot of variations on woman's guard. We're going to use this one for now. I'm going to show you two. The first one, again, going back to earlier, whichever side my sword is on, that foot is back. So I put my sword on my shoulder, my left arm tucks in, but now you'll notice my left shoulder is way forward and my hips are pointed over here, which means, but in that picture, I'll see it. If I'm in woman's guard like this, I'm hitting right there, but I'm not hitting my target. So in order to hit my target, I need to move my body. And if I move my body first, I just told my opponent what I'm about to do. So instead, I want a wide stance. So when I go to woman's guard, I'm going to take my lead foot, move it over and back. Now, I don't need to move my upper body at all other than just pulling my hands down. Woman's guard, post the didana. Then, from post the didana, 
were standing in post of Didana. I widen out the stance, tuck that elbow in, because that's a target if I don't. I'm going to lift my hands up. So they're just, my blade is just above my head. Now I'm going to push my pommel back and drop my hands down. Now we're in Posta Reale de Finestra, window guard. So again, woman's guard, up, push your pommel back so your point comes forward. You're not moving your lead hand. You're only using your lead hand as a fulcrum. Then drop it down so your shoulders go down. Now you're in window guard. Again, my lead arm is crossing my body, so I need a wide stance. Window guard. Woman's guard, post the Dana. Window guard, post the Finestra. And there are three guards on the high line. So now I step forward and put my sword on my left shoulder and put my thumb on the flat of my blade. Woman's guard, left. Or post the Dana. Sinestra. In Fiori's manuscript, it's Posta Didana uh, Reverso or Reverso Posta Didana. I just think Sinestra sounds sexy. That's the only reason. So Posta Didana Sinestra. Step. Now I have my right foot forward. Step back into Posta Reale, women's, uh, window guard, and then back to woman's guard. From woman's guard, window guard, into woman's guard left, post the Didana Sinestra. Those are our 12 guards. Five low, four middle, three high, and that brings us to our last one. Oh, I wanted to show you another variation of woman's guard in Fjord. Again, as a general rule, whichever side your sword is on, that foot is back. So if I'm facing my opponent and I'm in woman's guard like this, I've got it resting on my shoulder. My point is not down, but my pommel is up and back, and my point is at that kind of angle. If I want my right foot forward, I can do that, but you'll notice how that brings my arm into range. So, and this is what we see in Fjord. I lift that arm up, and now my sword goes on the back, goes straight down the back. And it looks, in the manuscript, like this. So when you look at the manuscript and you see Posta Didana versus Boar's Tooth, this is the picture we see in the manuscript. Let's get it. And you're wondering, why would he have his back turned to the opponent? He doesn't. Well, that's a whole other thing that I'm going to do an interview with my teacher, who is Brian Stokes. I, if I ever have a question about Fjord, I go to that man because he knows more about that manuscript than anyone else I know. So if you ever have a chance to take a class with Mr. Stokes, jump on the opportunity. There's our 12 guards from Fjord with a variation of woman's guard. So we have woman's guard with the left foot forward and a woman's guard with the right foot forward. And that brings us to the 13th guard, the outside guard. This is one that I pulled out from Filippo Body's manuscript from 1487. In 1487, Filippo Body has this guard which is post the Falcone. This is also the guard that we saw used in Kingdom of Heaven, which was one of the first movies to use a actual medieval term for a sword fighting position in a Hollywood movie. They did it wrong, but it doesn't matter. They had the idea. Uh, so if this is post the Falcone, I personally don't like that guard. It takes the time is too long unless I've set it up for something else. I don't like starting there. So instead, our 13th guard, we go to what uh, Body calls Posta Didana, 
women's guard. But we already have three women's guards, so I don't want to add another one and confuse people more. So I took, I took Falcone and just dropped it down in front of the shoulder. And this is what we call post Falcone. Think of it like you have a bird of prey sitting on your shoulder and it's about ready to dive out of the sky and take your opponent's eyes. The nice thing about this transition to Falcone is that it is a direct transfer from woman's guard. So if you go into woman's guard, and John is in post Titana, and he just pulls his right elbow back, he's now in post Falcone, which is why I think body called this post Didana. It's just an evolution of that guard. But I want to have a spot to stop. Uh, for more information on the cut, go back to our YouTube channel and you can see a uh, two videos, one on cuts and one on trajectory versus target. So you can watch those at your leisure. So our 13 guards, five low, Four middle, three high, one outside, Falcone. Those are our 13 guards that we use. And remember, when you're fencing or fighting against your opponent, you are not trying to hit him. I know it sounds weird, but many of you have heard this already. You're not trying to hit your opponent. You are moving through your guards, and your opponent gets in the way. After all, I know... I'm the most important person in the world. And if I'm fencing against John and I'm trying to hit John, I'm thinking about John and I've just made him the most important person in my world. So instead of trying to hit him, I move through my guards and I use my footwork because everything starts at the feet and he gets in the way. There are our 13 guards with the long sword. From there, we're going to move into our guards with unarmed we have four guards thank you and these guards in fjord are based on let me qualify that the longsword guards are variations of the grappling guard so we're doing it kind of backwards the first guard we have is we're going to start with our hands just in the middle just kind of relax like you're Cowboy tucking your thumbs into your belt, but they're sending down here. Meza Porta de Ferro, middle iron door. They're not against your body, they're out just a little bit. From Meza Porta de Ferro, you're going to lift up your lead, your uh, right hand, so that it's just outside your head, and pull your, le your left hand back so that it's parallel with the ground. This is Denfedi Chingale, boar's tooth. Because like the tooth of a boar, it attacks from underneath. This could also be an uppercut. From boar's tooth, leaving our left hand where it is, extend your right hand out. So it's yeah, all the way extended, but not locked. You never lock out your arm. Because as soon as you do that, you've locked everything and a locked joint is a broken joint. Watch the shoulder through the two here, okay? And you see how it extends out, hyperextends in that position there a little bit? Which means it's gonna be that much easier for his opponent to damage him. And another thing, back for a second, if I'm a punching bag, I'm smarter than that, but we'll just say it for right now. No, really. Yep. yep. I don't think I like it too much. Um, and my, my, my guy is throwing punches at the back, right? What happens, and how many of us have done this, where you're just a little bit out of range, and you throw that punch, and you get that lock that hurts your elbow, and you just barely touch it, but all that energy has to go somewhere. So it pops out of your elbow, and you hurt yourself. Now imagine all that energy that you're throwing into it, plus something he's doing. And what guard did I end up? Force you. So we have 
Where's the portrait of the Pharaoh? Pente Digale, Costa Longa, Longard, both hands out, is Frontale, or this is Frontal Guard of the Crown, Costa Frontale of Corona. But now I'm doing it unarmed. And with this Frontale Guard, my position is at his eyes or his throat. And so those are our four guards. Meza Porta de Ferro, Dente di Cingale, Posta Longa, Posta Frontale. I can do it with either foot forward. It doesn't matter because my hands are not tied together on one weapon. <clears throat> so there's my four unarmed guards. In my B safe class, I've added a fifth guard. That fifth guard is check your hair. So it's a continuation of boar's tooth, just pulling it back. So now I've turned my elbow into a spear. And again, I can do it with either hand and my elbow becomes a spear. So we have, let me tell you about the way I've, I've even renamed them for my b safe class, my women's self-defense class, because let's be honest, it's the 21st century. Women who are learning to be safe and take self-defense classes, probably don't care about the medieval names for guards. However, if you can think of something in your training that is equivalent to something you do every single day, everything you do all day long is going to be nothing more than helping you in your training. So make your martial training your everyday life, and then your everyday life becomes your martial training. With that said, we have here, we call this one wave close. If you're waving to your friend who's just on the other side of the room, you'll do this, wave close. If you're waving to your friend who's on the other side of the parking lot, wave far away. If you have to open up the trunk of your car, open the trunk. Now when you're done, slam the trunk and then check the hair. Because when you're doing the police reports after you beat the attacker to unconsciousness, you want to make sure you look good for the police. So we have slam the trunk, open the trunk, way far away, way close, check the hair. Those are our five guards that we use in our V-Safe class. The way that we can use it is my attacker. Hello, I'm Steven. I'm your victim today. Hello, Steven. I'm your attacker today. <laughs> Little does he know, I took the B-safe class. Wait, wait, <clears throat> so I'm walking along. First off, I'm aware. Secondly, he comes in to grab me. So I, I step out and I just uh, go to board you and to check my hair. And then I've got other things I can do. We do that again, does that, and I do that, and I can go in. That's not where I'm going to stay. This is just cover me. Uh, don't do what I did the first time. I moved my body. This is a real danger, and I did it to myself. So I know it happens because I do it too. When he's reaching for me, go real slow. His hands were here. I moved my body, but my head stayed in place. And I put his fingers right into my eye. That was uncomfortable. Don't do that. Make sure when you move, go ahead and grab on me. I'm not going to move. Great. Can you do it again? Move your head, too. Don't move your body and leave your head. Otherwise, same thing. You're going to take fingers right to the eye. And now, John was being very uh, good at helping me in the demonstration. He played it off like he didn't hit me. We both know what I did. Train yourself correctly. No matter how you good you are, always return to the fundamentals because those fundamentals are the, whatever your fundamentals are, they are what you practice the most. And what, when it all goes to hell in a handbasket, those are what you're going to do correctly, whatever you practice the most. So make sure when you're doing these drills, you're really practicing. Now, 
the one action I want to do is we're going to say John has grabbed onto my shirt. And he's threatening me. This is he's threatening me. He's going to punch me because he's a big, bad, scary dude. He's a big, bad dude. He's a big dude. <laughs> this is really hard to play off, okay? I have a choice. I can either ignore this hand and deal with the attacking hand, or I can ignore the attacking hand and deal with the grabbing hand. One of the things Fiore says is if he's got a grip on me, it's as good as if I've got a grip on him because he can no longer use this hand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reach up. Now we're in frontale, wait, uh, over the trunk. I'm going to put my hands onto his arm, slide it into his wrist, and bend his wrist. Front punch me, I'm going to move. He can still hit me, but he's lost. So I'm not that. So hit me again. Uh, punch me. He's got that. Punch me. He's got that much too. So, without me grabbing onto his hand, punch me. You see how far he moves? When I just pull his hand in, he's only got that much movement. I still get hit, but it's nowhere near as bad. However, I'm not going to stand there and let him hit me. So he does that. I come in, I grab. I come in, I pull his hand down, and I pull it tight onto my body. When I step back, I want to move back so my back foot, my whichever side the attacking hand's coming from, moves back onto the ball of my foot, but my upper body doesn't move. There's no movement of my upper body. You don't want this. Because what did I just do to you, John? How? Not only did I tell him I'm leaning away from him, because I'm holding on to him, I pulled him into me. So, what put on my head again? I want to move my back foot without moving my body. And I just touched the ground. Uh, another thing I want to point out. When we're doing training like this, nobody is going to grab you and threaten you like this with a locked out arm. They're not going to do that. You got too many things. When somebody's coming into threat, they're here because they want to pull you into it. They're in tight on you. They're not going to be doing it at full arm extension. So don't train like that. Remember, we've mentioned this many times. Don't train yourself falsely. So go back here. He's got a good grip on me. Oh, that's a much better one. I come in. I pull his hand across into my chest. Step back. And then turn. Hook him. And then reach down. The Sorry, I'm watching a lot of Master Kennedy. So, so let's go through that real slow. We'll do this up slow. He grabs on. He's got a good grip. He's twisting my shirt, controlling me, intimidating me. I pull it in, and I pull his thumb to my chest, and I hold it as tight as I can. I step back, and I spin. See how that bends him? Then from there, I come up, poke his chin, put him on the ground, and then walk away to get my coffee. Oh, wait. Three points are going. Ah. Trademark, Master Ken. Anyways, this is one of the drills that we do in our Be Safe class. And this is if somebody grabs onto you, you don't push them away. Because as soon as you do that, you've now given them a target. So these are some of the things we work on. Uh, I'm going to stop here. I've been going for about an hour. Before we go, I want to... If you have a question about anything we did, go ahead and put it up, type it in, and then we'll close out. So 
I'm going to give you just a few seconds to see if there's any questions that come in. I want to thank you for joining me and John. It's been a pleasure. We have to be a part during this time, but just because we have to be a part physically doesn't mean we can't continue to train. Practice your guards. Move through your guards. See how they they move right around your body. I, what I want you to do is as you're moving, I want you to feel that how it stays in tight. You're not throwing your arms out wide. Good mantra. Hold your hands up, tuck your elbows in, put your thumbs right in front of your shoulders. So you're standing like this, and then you repeat to yourself, this is all the space in the world I care about. Anything I do out here is wasted time and energy. This is all the space I, in the world I care about. And it's not the outside of your shoulder. It's right inside your deltoid. So we want it to be here, not here. And the reason for that is not because we can take hits to the arm and survive them. Yes, but really, who wants to get stabbed or cut in the arm? It's unpleasant. The reason for that is because I know I'm going to incorporate my footwork with my tool, my sword, my hands, my knife, whatever it happens to be. And that's how I'm going to move that last two inches out of the way. You have something you want to say? No, I just noticed there that I still have my uh, live steel pocket knife on me there while we were about grappling. So don't do that. So I want to say thank you, everybody, for joining me today. Thank you for going through it. I hope you enjoyed it. Practice your guards. If you make them so natural that you never think about where you're stepping to, you just end up there. That's one last thing you need to think about. And Fiore talks about that with his elephant. He never loses his way. Don't step without knowing where you're going to step. And the only way you can think about other things and not your guards is by doing it so much that you never have to think about it. With that, we're going to salute out. So thank you very much for joining us. As always, it's a pleasure. Stay safe. For now, stay home until we can come out safely. And we'll see you all later. All the best. Until next time.